Welcome back to episode 67 of the Sports Medicine Project. I'm Blake, I'm here with my co-host Kelly Kortik, and we are here for part three with Adam Diddick. Kelly, how My favourite doing? part so far, I think. I yeah, think it was I got good. the most out of this one and, and I really enjoyed this conversation. I think it was covered lots of areas and lots of topics and yeah, I'm excited for everyone to give it a listen. Yeah, so I've got part three with Adam. We've also got, as we usually do, a brief, uh, I guess, intro into our kind of clinical week and the last couple of weeks because we were absent at the Greg Lehman course, which is bloody awesome, which we're going to talk about today anyway. But we, with Adam, delve into a couple of things, obviously the world of running and coaching, but a couple of topics such as working and collaborating with clinicians, the benefits for coaches and clinicians, the recent trend of double threshold days, which I thought was pretty cool, and discuss the key aspects of I guess what a recreational runner needs to have in their training and also the importance of strength training for the athlete, strategies to progress runners with more volume and intensity, which I really love because we talk about it from a clinical standpoint, but it was great to, I guess, plug in the performance side of it as well. I think this episode covered a lot more for the relevance in in clinicians in working with run coaches and clinicians working with runners Mm. and how communication is so paramount in tying that all together so yeah i think it was it was really valuable but obviously if you haven't listened to episode one and two jump back and get those ones into you before part three yeah i might just correct you there don't go to episode one and two because that's our very first episode with the podcast part one and two yeah part one and two and all you gotta (laughs) yeah type in adam diddick on spotify sports medicine project and you'll have all all three which is cool so that's what we cover we all actually we did um, cover running technique which was was pretty interesting but Mm. we won't spoil it too much or let you find into that now we talked also greg lehman People making biomechanics complicated, popliteal case study, and yeah, mostly about the Greg Lehman course because that was, was pretty cool. But mm. highs and lows, Kelly, what happened this week in the last couple of weeks? Anything to talk about or we're jumping straight in? I had a couple of highs this week. My Sweet. first high was a referral for a, but what, I don't know if I, yeah, I guess I'd call it a high. So I treat this patient's daughter and she sent me her mum for a physiotherapy assessment to start a prehab plan before getting a bilateral total knee replacement. Mm. And it was really interesting. It just felt almost like backwards. I was telling you about this the other day. felt like backwards pain education because she had, and and it was quite confusing also just given what we know now about osteoarthritis and how we best manage it and when when it's sort of indicated to go down maybe a surgical pathway but she was like no none of you medical professionals can understand why I have no pain but my x-rays look terrible I have I'm bone on bone and there's no space between my knee joints but I have no pain and and none of you can understand why and it was quite interesting because I was like well I understand why that's that's something that I see commonly actually often it's sort of the other way around but it certainly makes sense as to why you're experiencing that and then further down the the conversation we kind of found out that the reason she had no pain is because she was sort of continually um, regressing her walking and her activities and Mm. loads so she was she was avoiding all the things that hurt which is why it wasn't hurting so Certainly, I now understand more so why she was going down that surgical pathway and why the the need maybe for the knee replacements was higher than when she first came in and said, I have no pain, but I need these bilateral total knee replacements. Anyways, it was just a very interesting way to sort of explain to her why that might be the case and how other things can tie into Hmm. the whole pain science and um, low-grade information and just all of those sorts of things and it was a big it was a big win because she she kind of walked away from it almost being like oh well you know maybe maybe I won't even need this knee replacement I mean I haven't even tried physio I haven't even tried exercise yet and I was like well I don't know maybe that's up to you yeah I thought it was interesting when you were explaining this case to me you you must have just explained it really shorthand because you said this person's got knee OA on imaging with no pain and she's getting surgery Mm. and I was like what that's yeah. Definitely, you know, that's not indicated at all. And then I think even a, a couple of days later, you brought up that, that case again. And then, yeah, as you said, she'd been regressing mm. her activity and training load, which it just goes to show I could imagine how much my 
my understanding of that had changed just purely based off one small bit of information. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. It was a really interesting consult because it was it was just quite different to a lot of the other cases of osteoarthritis that you see. Because typically the main reason people see you is because something is painful, and it was more because she is not functional, but because any time she was trying to be, it was painful, so she just wasn't doing anything. So I understand it now that she gave me the whole story. But at the start, it was quite yeah, it was quite funny, and I was sort of questioning, you know, yeah, maybe why is she going down that surgical pathway if she's not having pain? Because typically the the main sort of reason to go down that surgical pathway is pain typically mm. i would suggest yeah so anyways what was your big high or highs of the week yeah i had a, a double high and a low double, in, double in whammy. yeah it was a high and a low i had a lot of cases this week that were incredibly challenging that i really didn't know what was going on a couple i had to get some other opinions within the consult and it was a low and it always feels like a low. I don't think it ever does it. You ever don't get worried about the patient thinking that you don't know, but it was also a high because I felt really comfortable explaining that and being transparent and saying, I don't really know exactly what's going on. However, these are all the stop gaps and barriers that we're putting in place. Sorry, not barriers, stop gaps that we're putting in place to make sure that we can rule in or rule out, you know, the nasty sinister stuff or the things or the most common things that we see, which included some imaging, some referrals. And yeah, it was, it's always tricky when you have someone there that is in pain and really wants to know what, what's going on, what they can and what they can't do and they're looking to you for advice and you are meant to be the expert and you're just not going to, to always know. And I think previously I probably would have fumbled my way through that and said something like, you know, it's a joint, it's a ligament and really just taken a guess. But I say something along the lines of, you know, it's not fitting in any particular box at the moment. These are the things we're going to do to rule in and rule out and that's all we can do at the moment. However, these are some strategies that we can help and do right now to help you move a little bit more out of pain but that's about it and that's all we can do for the for this moment so it was a bit of a low and a bit of a high i tell people i don't know what's going on with them all the time yeah do because you don't actually know i typically or because you're i know okay i wouldn't say that we always know and mm. again things can always fit into the same box but i don't say it definitely 100 percent. it's just impossible to be something else i say it's pretty likely to be this for most people I I think a lot of the time things don't particularly fit into boxes. Mm. Maybe that's... The foot. Maybe, maybe the foot. Yeah, maybe, the foot maybe it's different. Probably. Maybe it's different. And I'll often say, look, based off our assessment today, yeah, it's, it's maybe it's not fitting super clearly into a particular box, but from our assessment, we've ruled out anything sinister or nasty. So mm. I think we can go ahead with this sort of intervention and, and treat it as this. And we'll try these things and I'd imagine that they should be providing you with some sort of improvement. And if they don't, then let's go down path B, C, D if we need mm. to. I guess you don't always know, but I find I can, I'm, I am confident based off what we know about the tissue. I mean, maybe it's a bit simpler in the foot. There are certainly cases where things don't match and it could be one or two things. And for most things, the treatment doesn't change too much, but maybe it is just the foot and the ankle. Do you find that in other body parts? Like you're pretty confident it's behaving like a tendon, it's sore where a tendon will be sore. It can make you think a tendon. Do you ever have patients ask what's going on? Ask what's, yeah, all the time. Like that's why they're in there, right? Yeah, is as there... in like what's the diagnosis more so. Yeah, and, and again, that's probably, not, like we've spoken about this mm. on the podcast before, but that's where I'm more vague and, and I will call, I will diagnose things as load related mm. shoulder pain or mm. load related neck pain or persistent low back pain. Yeah. And that's, that's all I give them. And I say, look, I, I'm unable to give you an exact structure that is contributing to this pain because I think there's a lot of things that are influencing why you're feeling the way that you are. Mm. Based off this presentation, it's pretty clear that at the moment your back or your neck or your shoulder aren't coping with the load that you're trying to place on it. Mm. So what we might need to do is temporarily modify what you're doing so that you can continue to do the things that you want to do within the limits of what you can tolerate while we gradually start to expose you to restricted and painful movements and, and, and then eventually start to load up your neck, back, shoulder. If we don't get the 
improvements that I would anticipate we should get, then that's when we can go down different pathways and explore option B, C, D. But yeah, I, I tell people I don't know things regularly. Mm. I wonder how much they really do want to know and they're just being I don't polite. think we can. Yeah. I don't think you can tell. I don't think you can be confident for a lower back or a neck mm. or a lateral hip or a shoulder yeah. what is causing the pain. I think you can be confident, definitely. I think I you can be over 50%. Like if it was a 50-50. Based how off, how uh, do you differentiate in the lateral hip between a tendon, <laughs> a bursa? Well, wouldn't you just use the properties that would irritate, like purely just based off their subjective history? I mean, again, not saying 100% confident, but I think that if a, a tendon would behave a little bit different to a bursa, purely based off the warm-up phenomenon, maybe stiff the next morning, doesn't like fast rates of loading, whereas a bursa, it may fit those, but it may not. I think you can definitely, do you, based do off you your assessment... Do you have to give them, though, a diagnosis, or can that, you say... That wasn't the question. No, 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 that wasn't the question. We were talking about if you were more confident, and I think based off those assessments, you could definitely be more confident. Not 100%, though. For, maybe. Maybe. Oh, maybe, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that you need to or, or not, but I do wonder how much, because there is some research to show that patients who view their body through a biomedical lens, and that's why the pain stuff can sometimes be a bit tricky to get across, but I do agree with you. For Maybe for us it doesn't matter too much because you can call it load-related heel pain or load-related shoulder pain, but I do wonder, and I know there's, there's lots of discussion about that from people, whether you need a diagnosis or not, but then I think maybe if there is something sinister, you do need a diagnosis. So I guess it's rule out the nasty stuff and then mm. otherwise it doesn't matter, but maybe it does matter. I don't know. I wonder if the treatment outcomes would change if you did give them a diagnosis. But then there's that study with lower back pain when they say, they use the words like lumbar strain, back pain and something else. And Compared to... Uh, disc bulge, disc bulge degeneration, degeneration yeah. things like that and there's a big difference yeah but i guess it would be cohort specific as well because i and i'm sure you've got some people as well that that do really need the diagnosis like what is going on me i just need to know and if they come in like that yeah. and they're like i think it's my disc then i'll be like yeah look i think you've got some discogenic lower back pain and the good thing is that discs can heal mm. they're made to be loaded they're made to be moved and that's what's going to make them feel better so mm. these are the things that we're going to do even if i I don't know that they've got discogenic lower back pain, but if they're attached to that diagnosis, I don't think that there's any harm in rolling with it. Yeah, I'm just I'm imagining like a flow chart where up the top you've got diagnosis and then to the left you've got rule out the nasty stuff and then to the right you've got load-related pain. Which and is then, the majority of things. Yeah, which is the majority <laughs> of things. And then it's, I imagine if things continue to get better, you keep going down the flow chart, but if they don't, maybe the arrow then points to the nasty mm, sinister stuff. There you go. There's your next post. Yeah, that's it. That is it. That would be that's a good one. That's a good one. Well, we definitely talked about that topic a little bit too much. What do you want to say about Greg Lehman? Well, I think that course? that flows in quite nicely to the Greg Lehman course, which was amazing, the by flow, the way. Flow chart's in. There's, your, flow ne chart's there's in. your next post in eight weeks. <laughs> I highly recommend Greg Lehman's course. If he came back to Australia, I would do it a second time mm. without a doubt. Mm. And the main, well, maybe not the main thing, but a big component of his course was that I got from it is we don't need to be as complicated as people make it mm. <laughs> with at the diagnosis and with the mm. rehab plan. Mm. A lot of the time we don't need to overcomplicate things and it's, it can be simplified for both the patient and ourselves and have really good results. Yes. Yes. What do you think? Yep. I agree. The, yeah, so many takeaways from that course. It was a great course. And I said this a little bit online, you know, I, I spent $500 on a dry needling course in my new graduate year. I think I spent more. Yours, yeah, because you're bloody. They would make you kill it off. Is it, who did you do it to? It was over $1,000. You, oh. Imagine a thousand dollars. Do you know what I, I remember? Never use it anymore. Do you remember what I remember? Do you From remember the course. what I remember most clearly? I remember getting down to dry needle someone's TFL and I was kneeling and the course runner the person. person. Was it GMT? GMIT? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. They must be billionaires. He came over yeah. to me and he's like, What are you kneeling for? You're going to ruin your knees. <laughs> <laughs> 
And now looking back, and I was like, oh, shit, should I get up? And now looking back, I'm like, you would say like that, wouldn't you? Oh, you just like, while well, you're kneeling, just bang, starts kneeling your knee, going, we need to protect this knee. That patellofemoral oh. joint's going down. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. You just know the kind of archetype of person. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I remember, oh, yeah, that was wild. I, I remember him, so he, as a was guy. Was the same person? Uh Maybe, I don't know. We probably shouldn't talk about it. <laughs> oh, I'm very, um, he, yeah, there's lots he's of guys. He's not listening to this podcast. Yeah, he's definitely not listening to something like this. So I remember, so he made us lay someone down and yeah, it was wild. So lay them down, they're laying on their stomach. So this is a needle in the insertion of the Achilles and he would, so you're, you're facing the sole of their foot and you would get a needle, you would stick it in the Achilles and then you would turn the needle, sorry, you would push the needle down towards their calf, so towards their head and then you would needle in towards the back of the foot like it was coming back at you. And I remember thinking, what the fuck is going on? This would be so irritable to someone yeah. with an Achilles. And I'm I remember... Like, I've got an irritable assertion. Can you imagine Achilles, that? Right? And, and I could just although... imagine to sell that to someone. So they've got an irritable Achilles. Like, hey, we really need to stick this needle in there. Release but the tension. Like yeah. Well... And do, this but flows do they like it? Point. Do they like it because of how you've explained it to them? Like, if I say to someone... If you have this giant kneeling, your Achilles is going to get better. They're happy to have it. Mm-hmm. But I wonder how much they like it because someone's just going around and around. Well, this actually flows in quite nicely to our second point in the Greg Lehman course. Mm. Is that a lot of allied health practitioners are essentially doing the same thing with mm. different narratives. So they are desensitizing an area mm. through either something like dry needling or massage yeah. or trigger point or... Whatever. fascial release or whatever it is they're they're desensitizing that area and mm. changing your nervous system our narrative to that is that we're desensitizing the area and changing their nervous system mm. the narratives to some of the other health practitioners might be a bit different and i like to think that ours is better and maybe less harmful yeah down the, the track yeah. in the long term yeah, yeah. And in the short term, I suppose. Yeah, I think that you're right with the... We're, we are doing... Oh, you definitely are right that we're all essentially doing the same thing. I know we have an episode on here and we're purposely left it up when we were talking about dry needling. This is like episode three or, or four. We bashed it a little bit in mm. the sense of when it's used with... Sorry, in the context, when it's used with a bad narrative, like you're releasing something because it's tight or you... Or they you need have, to come back every time they've got yeah, this problem. Yeah, mm. and I've certainly changed my mind on it now to, to some degree if you're spending 30 minutes just needling someone mm. i don't think you should be doing dry needling but if you're spending five or ten minutes and then you're then getting the moving and explaining all the things about it and explaining that it's very likely just playing around the nervous system and if you feel better that's great that seems to be a, in line with the evidence and yeah, the right thing to do i, I agree mm. and and the same thing you know the <laughs> the example that greg lehman gave was the difference between uh, Peter O'Sullivan and Stuart McGill. So yeah. Peter O'Sullivan's very spinal flexion based and getting your spine moving and Stuart McGill's very uh, lumbo-pelvic stability. You've got to maintain that neutral spine. And in someone with pain, both modalities are giving the patient a temporary option to feel better and then gradually over time exposing them back to the more painful activity or their meaningful mm. task. So again... They're very different explanations and they're, they're very different management strategies. But at the end of the day, some people get the same result. Yes, and one of the main, or I guess two main differences between that is, one, the narrative is, is usually better, and two, with Peter O'Sullivan, essentially you've got a lot of different options because mm. your what you believe in is... You need to get you back to flex your spine. Yeah, give the example about the orthotic. Yeah, I think that that's makes what sense. I was getting there. And then Stu Miguel, with his example, is you've got to maintain a neutral spine. So if you don't, you're doomed, basically. Yeah. So I thought of this example with, and I've talked to a couple, another couple of podiatrists about this. And if you are a podiatrist and you don't know about root theory, I'll try it. Or if you're not, if you are a podiatrist, I'm not a podiatrist. Maybe I'm, it's getting too late to me now. Maybe I need to start doing these podcasts in the morning. Yes, so bring on the early morning podcast. Yeah, I just can't, can't articulate it. I work too much today. If you are anyone listening to any podcast ever, <laughs> far out. <laughs> 
if you're a human yeah. and you listen I'm to me, I'm not even going to cut that in there. This now. is I for you. I deserve, <laughs> I deserve this to go out to the public. If you are a podiatrist and you haven't heard of root theory, I'm going to explain it. If you're an allied health professional, I'm going to explain it. If you listen to this podcast, I'm also going to explain <laughs> root theory. Or just skip forward 15 seconds. <laughs> yeah, so this is root theory. So Square root. Very, very simply, we used to think that people or people's feet had a neutral position. We call that subtalar joint neutral. And the further someone's foot deviated away from that, the more pathological they are. So they roll in or roll out or whatever. And with an orthotic, the idea was to post them to their neutral position. And if you wanted to fix them, that's how you had to do it. So your only option was to post them to the neutral or their subtalar joint neutral. Whereas how we use them now, we just think of tissue stress theory where we're just modifying and playing physics and moving forces around. So when you think of those back to first principles, they're both just shifting load around. Mm. So if two people came in with the same pathology, you could use both theories and probably get a result because you're moving stress essentially off the tissue that's injured. However, with root theory, you're stuck to one principle where you have to put them to their neutral. Whereas with tissue stress theory, you're just moving it around until they're not irritable. So you've mm. got a lot more options. And the narrative's not very harmful. We've explained to someone hey, this orthotic is, is very short to medium term. We're just unloading the, the tissue so it feels better. Get it strong. And when it doesn't, in most cases, we take them out. Whereas root theory, it's like you have to leave this in because you have to stay at your subtalar joint neutral, mm. which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, I think that that's a, a good thing to think about for a mm. lot of people. I yeah. think it's, yeah. And again, it's it, com- it, like, it simplifies things. So it's it made me walk away from the course being like, yeah, I'm doing the right thing. Mm. Yeah, it, it made me, and it leads on to one of our next topics. I don't know if you've yeah, seen fire this. fire today, just flowing. Yeah, one of the, not two minutes ago, I was not flowing, I was all <laughs> over the place. The, the people online, and I'm obviously getting targeted, just like how I was getting targeted with chiropractor ads, I'm now getting tar- targeted with biomechanics courses. <laughs> and man, some of these people are going so, so in depth with the biomechanics of the foot and the knee and the degrees and what's normative range and we're going to restore this and we can't do this until we restore this mobility in this joint. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? This is way too complicated. And it doesn't give you any benefit. It's definitely diminishing returns. Yes, you understand that the subtalar joint works in all three planes. Cool, that's probably not you all you need to know, but the more that you learn about the subtalar joint and the degrees of axis and it's 42 degrees from the sagittal plane, like what value is, is that going to give you? Because there's huge variance and mm. you're not going to be able to change that. Like it's just so much stuff and making it so I mean, complicated. I think it's good to learn. I think, I think having that foundation, well, maybe it doesn't need to be that in depth though, hmm. but I think having a good foundation of all the, the knowledge and the things that you learn about in uni helps you to build the next layer which is probably communicating with patients and then the next layer on top of that which is I don't know therapy or whatever it might be um so I think the more you know the better but I think it's how you no, apply it and no, how no, you no. communicate definitely it. not definitely not the more the you know more the better you know, I think the more you know the better I don't no. think that there's a bad thing to knowing and learning more I think you don't need to explain it all to your patients though but knowing more doesn't make you better knowing the theory of biomechanics in depth, crazy in depth, does not make you a better practitioner. You can't. You definitely it doesn't can't make you worse. How do you know? I know it definitely doesn't make you better. How do you know it doesn't make you better? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Knowing the intricacies, because how much is too much? Do you spend the next? You used to froth on the gate, guys. Yeah. What well, do you do? You think they know too much? I think that they know a lot, but I don't think that necessarily having a really in-depth understanding of biomechanics correlates exactly to being a better clinician. So it's not that the more you know, like you can really learn a lot about the subtalar joint. If I stopped learning everything else in life and just focus on the subtalar joint, I could probably learn about that for the rest of my life. Do you think yeah. that will make me a better clinician? Probably not. I mean, so much of good being a good clinician hinges on good communication and you're not going to learn that from learning about sub Taylor joint. Yeah, I just think it's diminishing returns for that kind of stuff where, mm. of course, the more you know, and even with the rehab, when we talk about the, the perfect exercise, the corrective exercise, the meso and the micro cycles and pure, so like you, maybe, you've, done your strength that's why... you've done your strength and conditioning course. Do you think that that's made yeah. 
yeah, that. I think that's maybe a better clinician. What about learning about the cycles and all the properties of tendons and learning what tenocytes do? I think that does help. I, I like to learn about that because I think it's important to know. How does it correlate to making a better clinician? Again, because I think the more you've got a foundational understanding of something, the better... <laughs> yeah, the foundational definitely, but... Well, where do you draw the line then? I don't know. I, I think that, that I think learning about tenocytes in tendons and how a tendon tendinopathy happens is foundational knowledge that you need to know. Yeah, yeah. But do you really know how it happens? Like no. down to the actual cellular mitochondria? No. No. But would you say that knowing that would make you a better clinician? Mm, no. <laughs> Uh, that's but there's, a, there's an amount that you need to know. Yes, 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 yeah. I completely agree. And I, so where's I'll, the line? I'll have to, I'll make sure when I go to bed tonight, I'll re-listen to this podcast and make sure I didn't say that you don't need to know anything. I do believe that you've got to have some knowledge and that's what you get from the degree. But I I think the knowledge is probably a little bit yeah, past... I just need a... Or the line's a little bit past the, the basics. Yeah. Okay, moving on. <laughs> I need to learn about tennis heights. Yeah, moving on. <laughs> what? I'm ready for you to move us on. Oh, it's your turn. Anyways, the rest of Greg Lehman's course was also <laughs> really, really good. Um, there was lots... He's so well read across all of the research and just picks it apart and, and sort of goes through lots of different areas and topics that are so valuable to us as clinicians. So, mm. yeah, highly recommend for everyone. Your turn. Yes. Well, I think we should end it there. Yeah. And I, I think, reckon. yeah. Yeah, let's do that. And this, not the, like, not me and you, just end the podcast. <laughs> yeah, okay. I agree with that. <laughs> no, that was, was good. That was good. We'll touch on, we've got a very exciting announcement coming next week, which is exciting. You might see a couple also, of Also, also, also before, before we go. Yeah. Blake and I this week, we signed up for the Rich Willy course oh, down in Melbourne yeah, yeah. on the 22nd and 23rd of April. Get so if that. you're a clinician and you're really interested in running, I highly recommend you guys sign up for that too because yeah. it's going to be a hoot. And I'm assuming that people that are going... Run! So we can run. all go yeah. for we want Sunday to do morning a long run. Sunday morning long run. Park and run maybe somewhere. Some, yeah, is the maybe. park run around the tan? Maybe. It's around. I've seen that, that loop that they do around the lake. I, I want to do that. So yeah, if you go into the course, please send us a message because we may want to he- come for a run. Mm. Definitely. Sounds good. For Sounds sure. Good. But we'll probably run like 320s or something like that. So don't come with this if you're not quick. <laughs> you might be running that quick. I won't. <laughs> All right, guys. Enjoy. See you later. Welcome back to another episode of the Sports Medicine Project. We have a return guest for part two, Adam Didick. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, no worries, guys. Thanks. Now, last episode with Adam, we had lots of questions and we didn't quite get through all of them. So I'm keen to to try and whiz through a a few of the the remaining questions that we had sort of left over, Um, probably stepping a little bit away from the elite athlete and and maybe more talking about uh, how we can best integrate uh, our work as as clinicians, if you're you're listening in a clinician, with running coaches. I think that's really important because running coaches, they spend so much time with the patient or the client and often and they're the person that the patient or client's going to be or the runner let's say is going to be unloading on and, and giving a lot more information to in in some cases so I think it's really good to collaborate can't hear you. Some questions, Adam. Yeah, we can't hear you. It's cutting in and out. <laughs> but we missed the last last minute or so. Do you want to turn your video off, maybe?
good. I might <laughs> cut in there. I mean, some technical difficulties, but that's okay. And then one of the, the questions you go, I have like... to, to ask is, you know, as, as clinicians and definitely seeing, you know, runners and, and trying to progress their running, we, we tend to find, I think it's just from a lack of knowledge, people can be a little bit sceptical of working with run coaches purely because they just don't know how they work or what's the best way to refer and, and utilise them. How do you think clinicians and, and running coaching can kind of collaborate well? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, the, the, the key thing here is to, to be who you are. If you're a um, if you're a coach, be the coach. Don't try to be the physio, podiatrist, or a doctor. Mm. Um, and, and likewise, on the on the flip side of it, each mm. each person involved uh, has their own specific skill set. Some uh, might be able to connect it very nicely. Uh, some some may not. I think the the one key thing from a coaching perspective that I've always tried to focus on is having a good level of communication with practitioners. Um, it's disappointing and frustrating when I see coaches and their their athletes are struggling with injury. And I said, "Have you spoken to the physio? Have you spoken to Dash? Spoken to Doc?" And no, not at all. And to me, that's largely unacceptable if you're um, if you're working at an elite level. I, I certainly understand why it happens um, from a, a a more recreational level because often the the volume of athletes that you're dealing with is is far greater. Um, but I, you know, that, that sort of leads back to one of the points we covered last time is about, you know, uh, do you provide something that uh, enables many people to be involved or do you provide something that allows people to specifically be involved? Um, likewise from a, from a, a clinician's point of view is, you know, recognizing that just when that uh, that runner walks out your door, it, it's not necessarily the end of what your true responsibility is to support them to get back. Um, I I have a very high consciousness of practitioners who actually communicate with me and those who don't. Mm. And if they don't communicate with me, then my recommendation to go back to that person is limited. They have to be extremely good to be able to get away with with no communication to the coach and, and the reason why that that line of communication is so important is because ultimately i will have questions for that person um there, there's a there's a big part of working with injuries to recognize what's what's causing it um and if, if i don't know that then how can i not steer them into that situation again um mm -hmm. also you know, we, we recognise the challenges associated with taking a significant amount of um, time off. So if they can't do a certain style of activity, what can they do during that period? And then I feel it's largely up to the coach to work with the practitioner to recognise a, um, a plan that will actually work going forward. Mm. Um, and with, with that, without that communication, I don't get the opportunity to ask questions. And the practitioner probably doesn't get the full context of what's caused the injury. And we are largely relying on the runner to understand, to be able to be the conduit of information between the two. And I feel like uh, in, in my experience, you know, an athlete rocks up to a, uh, someone with an injury. There's a psychological element to that that potentially impacts their understanding or their takeaways from that appointment. Um my hope is that from a coaching perspective that more analytical side of things can provide a greater context to what the future direction could be or what the potential causes could be. Mm. Yeah. What, what, what mistake do you see like in the communication channels, what mistake do you see clinicians make or something that they can work on? Is it, is it so much what they can't do or what they can do or, or that kind of thing? What, what do you see there? Uh, the, the biggest the biggest problem I have is when people consistently just point the finger at, okay, it's caused by load. Well, every yeah. single injury in my view is largely caused by load. But why was that load not tolerated at a certain period of time as opposed to a previous time? Uh, you know, if, if from a coaching perspective, you know that you've actively ramped it up and then you can accept the fact that maybe that accelerated too quickly. But often when there's no change of loading and I'm told it's a load injury, it, it does my head in because mm. um, ultimately there's something that's not enabled that athlete to absorb the load during that period. And that could be from a multitude of factors. And if we're mm. not looking at these factors then we're not understanding the true cause, you know, was that athlete uh, getting adequate sleep? 
were they mm. were they uh, fueling effectively? You know, was there something that uh, that triggered um, them to load differently? Mm. Um, so, so that to me is is a is a real problematic part of communication when it's just too too boxed into the load um, because yeah, that's ultimately from a running perspective what we're doing. We are applying load to to someone to get a training stimulus from that. Mm. I think that's really good, Adam. I really like that. And I I think that it I think that you raise a really good point in, in sort of asking a little bit more of that question why. And another reason why clinicians and, and coaches need to be collaborating so much. I'm not sure if you guys heard this because I know it might internet cut out. So, but what I was saying earlier was was that uh runners are often going to be unloading onto their coaches. Like you're you're the mm-hmm. person that they are communicating with the most and you're the person that they're going to be brain dumping on all the time. So if practitioners aren't communicating with their coaches, they're missing out on a lot of that information that could possibly be telling them the the why they're not tolerating mm. those loads. So yeah, I think that's really good. And and the reality is we're probably speaking to them a great deal more. So um, mm. so some of this context may not be brought up or, or drawn into the conversation when they're in the rooms of the clinician. And and that's the really that's a really hard part of it, you know. I, I think I think we've got to be careful that we don't make assumptions um, based on what coaches can do, because as I said, if you've got a if you've got a huge number of athletes in a rec running space, it's going to be very difficult to spend that amount of time to know mm. all about it. I think last time I used that that context of you know tell me three things about thirty people that you know, and uh, and and you know it should be an expectation a coach can do that. So if you if your coach can't present uh three things that they know about you currently about how you're coping with training and the likes then then they're not going to be able to offer a clinician too much more so Mm. i I certainly recognize the perspective from a clinician as well that if if they know someone's coming from a a rec running sense and they're part of a a training group that might have you know 100 or plus more athletes then Mm. um they they might have to take the lead and i've sort of had this feedback when i've challenged practitioners and they said well not everyone is as involved as you are as a coach. So mm. often we're, uh, yeah. you know, often the the patient is is leaning on us to be able to provide them some critical guidance as to what to do. And I, and I think that's a fair and reasonable perspective to offer from a clinician uh, point of view as well. Uh, but I, I sort of feel like, you know, look for the, look for the coaches who will, who will make that contact, who will have that connection. Um, and it doesn't hurt um for a, for someone to to be able to from a clinical point of view be able to provide a summary and uh, and and you know communicate that to the coach for an email and then that way if they need some back and forward then at least that that line of communication is open mm. but it's it's so important and and you know it really does also come down to the coach being a collaborator you know sometimes they're going to be um, struggling to work out how to absorb that information from a, from a clinical point of view and. And and may not want to admit it, you know. Whereas mm-hmm. for me, I, I'd rather I'd rather ask a dumb question than make a dumb decision because I'm not mm-hmm. informed and don't understand the situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Mm-hmm. When uh, sorry, oh, you go. no, you go. Uh, I, I was just sort of thinking as well in in the, the sort of building on the the point of of why injuries. Um, might not be tolerated or why that load might not be tolerated how much emphasis or value do you place on running technique and and running retraining uh in the presence of injury or or maybe maybe more in performance i'm keen to hear this one i've been working on mine recently adam and kelly runs next to me and making sure i look good because i want some good pictures when i'm racing so i want my technique to look good but i'm like do i really need to so yeah i'm keen to think for this answer because yeah we just don't know is as practice as we say that it, it may matter in regards to pain but in the absence of pain it doesn't matter but we're just not seeing the volume enough to get that feedback mm-hmm. to see it over time yeah look it's an interesting uh, question and uh look ultimately um i'll always put some level of focus on technique but it's not as massive as what people might think um so i look i've seen people with the greatest technique injured often I've seen people mm. with shocking technique injured never, mm. you know. So I, th- I feel like, um, you know, the way I look at it is, uh, is the body will take the path of least resistance. And so with with that in mind, trying to, I guess, train the body to take a, a better plane of movement is is great. 
But if they're fighting other aspects of their mechanics to do so, it may cause other issues. So I've always seen a, a technical change as not only a, a learnt movement pattern, but also um, having adequate range of movement, flexibility and strength to be able to hold that, that postural mm. position. And if that doesn't occur, well, we, we can do drills until the cows come home. Um, but if, if, they, if they are not taking care of the things that are actually limiting their movement or encouraging the movement to go in a certain direction, then that's another thing. And I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not a researcher on this, but I, I dare say there's a level of genetics um, applied mm -hmm. to to people who have, um, you know, certain tolerances from a from a soft tissue perspective. You know, like I said, I, I've seen I've seen people with absolutely shocking technique. You just think they're going to get hurt by running down the road and uh, never injured. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and then I've seen some of the smoothest movers injured always. So, mm -hmm. um, so you know I, I don't know I don't know I'm not convinced that technique is the biggest um, exponent to mm. to future injury um, I've, I've seen enough athletes now to to challenge that concept for myself um, yeah but yeah. but certainly if we're looking at running mechanical efficiency well from a performance point of view we'll try to improve that yeah. um, but like I said it's not a it's not a single, and not a single approach of okay let's learn how to do some uh, technical elements better it's about okay why are you running with that do you just not have the coordination um do you not have the strength do you not have the the, the flexibility to be able to move it the way that we're hoping you can do you find when, when you have tweaked or changed something do people and i'm sure it does vary do people pick it up quite quickly or it takes some time to kind of implement that I think it's I think it's quite a bit of time to implement it. Like I yeah. said, we're we're looking at a we're looking at a, a change that needs to occur <laughs> autonomously. You know, mm. like you, you've got to you've got to get to the point where that's just comfortable. Because often when you change someone's running techniques, uncomfortable because they're they're limited in some way, and that's why their their technique is is the way it is. Mm. Uh, like I said, it doesn't mean you shouldn't address it. It just means that you've got to be patient with that. And, and I feel like probably from my perspective with a background as a primary school physical education teacher, um, my view is that we should be teaching more of that movement um, in physical education in younger age kids, you know, mm. primary age kids. They, they should be taught how to, how to hop, skip, jump. They should be taught how to run. They should be taught how to change direction, absorb force, um, all of those aspects within their primary school physical education. Once we start getting them to the to the point where they're um, where it's really ingrained, it's pretty hard to change something you've been doing uh, <laughs> continuously for 15, mm. 20 years. Um, but uh, but you know at the same time, I've seen I've seen athletes as we've taken them from junior to senior have massive growth spurts and just become uncoordinated and having to keep reminding them of how to, how to do that movement. And, and ultimately it's the same thing, isn't it? You know, like the, the bones grow and, and probably at a rate that the, that the muscles and tendons can't keep up with. So their range of movements impacted. So they have to coordinate themselves to the length of their limbs and, and mm -hmm. uh, get that proprioceptive um, elements back to, to how they, how they move. So, uh, you know, I, I it, to me, it's a constant reminder, but uh, but it's something that we put into our training sessions, um, you know, numerous times a week. And it's, it's again, it's just to sort of support better movement. Um, mm. But, yeah, like I said, you know, my, my ultimate aim here is also to have a strength and conditioning coach who can work alongside that and s support that movement through what's happening in the gym and the strength development that we're hoping to gain that's specific to that. Mm. Yeah, on on that on topic of strength and I guess trying to categorize somehow when you've got I guess the elite and then your recreational runner, how do you find like strength and resistance training fitting in for both those two groups? Because you know I listen to a couple of podcasts and listen to to some of the elite runners and I don't hear them talk too much about the strength stuff. And I understand I actually got this from Nida when he was on the podcast talking about perhaps you can get stronger at running by just running more. And it's not inherently that doing resistance training will reduce your risk of injury, but it may improve performance a little bit. But how does that fit in there? Because I'm sure you've got to take some running out to put that in. How do you find that between the two groups? Yeah, look, I'm, I, I agree with Nitter on that. You know, like I think that uh, the best form of strength and conditioning for running is running. Uh, it's <laughs> yeah. the most specific yeah. uh, but uh, you know, and and whether whether I've seen dramatic changes in technique from strength and conditioning, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say I have. But uh, but ultimately, um, 
you know, I'm probably focusing more from a performance aspect. Mm. Uh, I, I think if I was to if I was to focus on anything from a rec perspective, it would be, you know, the old school thoughts of the '90s, which is you know having a stable platform to work off of, you know, having mm. a, having a core that uh, can can stabilise you enough to be able to allow you to get the power output out of out of your stride. I, I think it's as simple as that. Um, mm. When it comes to when it comes to running versus SMC, well, I think it comes down to the the athlete and what their what their requirements are. You know, if someone's a good enough mover, then just keep them running. You know, mm. I, I agree. I mean, personally, I hate doing strength and conditioning myself. <laughs> you know, like mm. I, I I I couldn't. You know, like I sit I sit within four walls enough during the day that I want to just get outside, and that's yeah. what I want to do with my exercise. So I absolutely um understand and empathize with people who don't want to step for into those four walls of a gym and do yeah. something and i also feel like unless you're doing something with purpose and and doing it properly sometimes better not doing it at all mm. you know so so if you're uh, if you go and step in the gym and just go i'll just lift that and you know move that well you know if, if you're not really doing it appropriately then i think sometimes there's more risk to it um, mm-hmm. But I think that's where, from my perspective, when I have a SMC program um, being designed, I strongly have it um, guided by a physiotherapist, and then um, and you know, or a podiatrist. It doesn't bother me one way or another. <laughs> we just give um, lots of foot in foot intrinsic. That's about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, look, I've 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 worked with some podiatrists who have been fantastic in in guiding an SMC program. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, they are the ones who are largely guiding the, um, the movement that we're looking for and where there might be some areas of, of critical focus. Um, what I will, what I will try to drive within that programming is the timing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where, where do we have a period of time where we can, we can push to make some gains? Where are some areas where I need, I need more of a maintenance focus than a, um, than a progressive focus. Mm. Um, and, and that all comes down to aligning that with competition, you know, and training requirements. If I've got someone doing really hard track sessions, I don't want a really hard gym session alongside of that for a distance <laughs> runner. Um, mm. but when they, when they're very much in a general phase of training, well, that, that's where I'm a little bit more open to exploration with an S and C coach. Um, but mm. I don't sit there and try and dictate what exercises they do. Um, yeah. I think to be honest with you, as I said, you, you stick to what you're good at and that's not an area that I'm amazing at. You know, mm. I've done my S and C levels, but I, yeah, it's still, it's not an area I enjoy working in too much. So I'd mm. rather leave it to someone who can do a better job of it than I can. But I think it's it's largely, as as I stated earlier, it's a collaborative approach to that, and that's why when you when you work with athletes, um, and and I get that that's a little bit different to a rec running space, but you know, rec runners can create this themselves. You know, you don't have to be an elite athlete to put the right people around you. Um, it's about making those decisions as to who are you going to have working with you and how are they going to communicate? And that's, that's largely what I see a key responsibility for a coach at a high performance level. How do you bring people in to collaborate to, to get them taking the path that, uh, that the athlete wants to take. And from a rec running perspective, how do you, how do you identify what your goals are and what you want to achieve and who do you need in your team to help you do that? And it may not be purely just the running coach. It may be a practitioner who who supports you with that. It, it may be a, a massage therapist because that's something that you feel is vital to your progress, you know, mm. or to keep you keep you on track to to delivering what you want. Might be a nutritionist who helps you work out what you need to eat, you know. Um, mm. So it might be a psychologist who helps you work out uh, how to how to manage certain aspects of your life to to be available for the performance you want when you're running. So all of those things are, are not exclusive to elite performance. Um, but ultimately elite performance is, can be, um, transferred to any, any stage of, uh, of an athlete's running and any aspect of someone's life. It's just about mm-hmm. having the right people around you to guide you to, to, to address the areas you need to address to, to perform better. Mm. Great answer. Thanks, Adam. Can you talk us through, still continuing on the topic of injuries a little bit, but can you talk us through a nice like common sense approach for reloading runners after either a long period of time off or after an injury where they've had to stop running, let's say, um, particularly for like clinicians uh, or runners who don't have a good knock, any a great sort of scope on returning to running? Yeah, I think I think it comes down to the the first thing I look at is is what's 
a greater risk to re repeating that injury? Is it force or is it um, fatigue? So mm -hmm. if an injury uh, is more fatigue based and we might be able to um, deliver, you know, greater force and not be an issue. But if, um, but if, if force is an issue, um, then, then maybe we can extend the, um, I guess the, the, the fatigued state and try to deliver more from a, a conditioning perspective on that. So, and, and I look at that in, in a number of ways. So, you know, reloading can often take time. The longer you've been out, the, the longer it's going to take to get back. And it's, you know, there, there's many equations that, um, that people apply to these circumstances. Some are, some are, you know, two to one for two weeks for every one week you've had to have off. But then it, then it comes mm. down to what did you do with that time off? You know, for, for many of the athletes I coach, they, they get stuck in a cross training and all sorts of stuff. Sometimes mm. my greatest concern is that they're too fit for what their body can manage as they return to yeah, running. I've heard that. So, yeah, I'm crazy. Yeah. I've heard that. Incredible. Like you're just not able to tolerate what you've done because you've got to get up over the break. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, 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 big, the big risk we've got there is from a, from a, um, from a reloading perspective, their, their body is not strong enough to be able to do what their, I guess, their heart and lungs are able to allow them to do. You know, where where one might be a restriction, uh, it's now flipped, and the other's a restriction. So, um, so you know, I, I'm I'm constantly with you know our more elite performers having to to really focus on what are some uh, um, boundaries to, that I need to put in place to support them from getting injured. So again, it, it it lends itself to some of the stuff we talked about previously, which is you know the faster you run, the the greater force you're applying to the ground so if that's an issue we need to we need to restrict them the, the pace that people are running or if um if fatigue's going to be an issue and they lose form because of that and start loading through their uh mechanically differently then that could be a, a greater risk and mm. so you know when you've got someone who's who's gone okay instead of running i'm going to go and get on the bike and you know double down on the bike and they come back really fit but you know we know that the bike whilst, whilst you're still using your legs, it's not plyometric strength, which is required for running. Mm -hmm. So, so you can, you can do something that's specific to your legs and go, well, I'm training my legs and my legs are still strong. Yeah. But they're not, they're not used to absorbing and applying force in the way you require to be a runner. So some of the ways that I sort of get back, you know, if, if someone's had a, a stress injury or, or something like that, uh, then it might be starting off uh, loading with just some, some running drills. And the reason for that is because they're, they're largely, you know, you're applying greater force than you would be walking, but you're not, uh, you're not in such a fatigued state. So you're starting to get confidence in, in your body to be able to do that. Um, and then, you know, it might be, uh, you know, getting in and doing some, some walk jogs to start increasing the amount of fatigue that you can tolerate. Um, and, and ultimately that's when, you know, I, I sort of state to the athletes, okay, this is not about conditioning from a, um, energy system or cardio point of view it's uh, it's more about reloading to help your body absorb the the impact forces that that running requires it to and to be able to have that plyometric strength to to i guess you know spring out of the ground so um you know th those are the those are sort of things that i'd consider um and then just slowly blending them in then we'll get to a point where i say okay the body's now strong enough to be able to tolerate you applying the training stress that you would you you're looking for to start developing your performance. Mm -hmm. Up until that point, I still may be utilizing cross training from a performance development point of view, whilst we bring the body along to um, mm -hmm. to continue um, uh, developing so that it can do the the full training loads. So mm -hmm. that's I, I don't think I've given you anything overly specific but i'm being a little bit v vague for a reason because all of those factors mm. are considerations from yeah. a reloading point of view yeah how like for, i don't know like with the younger athletes that you've coached over the years and, and with the coaches that you work with you know we've got a bit of prospective research now to say you know early sport specialization can be a risk factor for future injury and especially in runners how how do you combat or address that for, for the younger runner who just wants to run and is a good runner and enjoys running and trying to, to kind of get that, get that across to them and the parents where it's great that you love to do this and you're good at it, that's fine. But knowing that we probably need to try and drip feed some other stuff in there to try and a little bit of an insurance for future injuries. Yeah, I look, 100% agree with that. Like I, uh, one of the rules we have in our squad is if you're under the age of 15, you must play another sport. You cannot so just good. be a runner. 
So that yeah. that's basically, you know, something we, we mandated about 12 or 18 months ago because I was mm. concerned of the same elements and and without putting something structurally in place it's very easy for people to get obsessed with running it's a it's a, it's a obsessive kind of activity mm-hmm. that that people get hooked in on but the what what happens is if you're a runner you largely get used to moving in a in a straight line uh, mm-hmm. there's no there's barely any side to side movement so you know the, the other ways you can impact that um is by running on you know a variety of surfaces um but still you, you're still doing something in a in a single plane so um one of the things that uh, that i look at is you know kids playing basketball you know they're having to jump they're having to land uh, they're, they're applying different forces to their body like that they're having to change direction you know they're having to be more coordinated um and so all of that you know to, to me is hidden strength and conditioning mm-hmm. you know it's uh it's intrinsically uh uh, recognizing how to how to move and um, and utilize your feet, ankles, and you know balance yourself. So so I, I love all that sort of stuff. There's acceleration in you know you're playing footy, you're playing soccer, multiple accelerations in a game. I mean that that that's just amazing. You know like because again you're applying greater forces and you're moving your mass through uh, through a different motion. But if you're just running and just spend a lot of time running and you don't have those accelerations and 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 braking forces and all the rest of it, then then again, are you really developing a physically resilient body? And one mm. of the biggest issues we see in someone's performance not developing is that their body does not have a level of physical resilience to maintain the level of training required to achieve the outcomes they're looking for. So, and and I, I'm, I'm an example of that. Like I played heaps of sports when I was young, but I started um, going into football umpiring when I was about 12. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, back then footy umpiring used to, used to have change direction, turn around, run backwards and all these sorts of things. And, uh, and largely it was breaking me down, which showed I probably needed it more than, than I needed to get rid of it. But because it was impacting my running, I got rid of it. So hmm. I became very, very much just used to running. And so, you know, by the time I started kicking a soccer ball around and stuff, by the time I was 16, 17, um, I remember, you know, doing a fairly serious quad injury just by kicking a footy in PE. Okay, this is pathetic. <laughs> like what you know, yeah, how yeah. how how specific is my body to my movement? Uh, by the age of 17, I, I kick a footy in football uh, um in PE class and I hurt myself. I mean that, that's mm. just that's just ridiculous. So, you know, when I look back on my time in my um in my formative years, it was littered with injury. Um and then as I went through my early twenties, it was much the same. And I never got on top of it, no matter how much strength and conditioning and things I did, which I was pretty disciplined in doing that back then. I hate it now, but I used to do a lot of it back then <laughs> yeah. um, that I, I, you know, it was, it was sort of a bit of the undoing of me and what my potential was because my physical resilience was too low. You know, my kids now, like I've got a, I've got a six and a nine year old, so we're very early stages. But I'm so keen on playing multiple different sports, and and my eldest actually loves to run at the moment. But I say, yeah, we're not going to get too involved in that. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, let, let's let's just keep you playing basketball, let's keep playing football, keep playing soccer. Um, and you know, th- there's no suggestion that starting running at that age is actually going to help you to be a champion. You know, mm-hmm. the biggest problem we have in the, in the sport of athletics is we see significant drop off. So, um, so, and, and the sport doesn't change a great deal from when you enter it to when you go to the Olympics. <laughs> yeah, you're it's still, still very much the same. And, yeah. and so, so the modifications are largely in distance, but, you know, um, I, I, I keep looking at it and go, why, why do kids actually get involved in sport? They get involved in sport because they want to be with their friends. They want to play. You know, they, they're not all out there to run a PB to win the race. Yeah, mm-hmm. sure, some of them might enjoy that stuff, but but largely they're, they're probably more aligned with the adult um, goals for their kids rather than what their kids actually want at that period of time. So, you know, I think, you know, one of the biggest things we look at within our system is how do we help them to learn what uh, what it's going to be like to be a, an athlete as a senior? Um, how do we develop a passion? How do we develop a supportive environment so it's something they want to come to and be a part of, as opposed to you know a real serious um, sort of environment? So um, there, there's time for that. It doesn't yeah. need to be at a young age, you know. Yeah. Now we'll uh, we'll wrap it up with a couple of quick fire questions. Now I'm going to start with this one, and I personally no, I've, personally I've specifically made it rapid fire because you tell me a yes no, and I'm sure you would would like to explain it we have recently seen some high profile athletes and this isn't myself the athlete doing double threshold days 
What are your thoughts on this approach? Yes, no, maybe. If you're elite, if you're not, what do you think? I I think it has its place, yeah. um, but it is about managing it to be really specific to what it says. It's threshold. It's not smashing yourself twice in one day. Mm. Um, and and whilst I don't currently employ that strategy in our training, certainly something I'm, I'm I've been doing some reading about and and exploring mm. the idea and concept and how it might work in uh, to the system that we we train. So I'll put it down as a maybe. <laughs> I, uh, I'll, yeah. I'll, uh, and, and I've answered it with more than one one word, but that's that's <laughs> where I'm at at the moment. Yeah, and favourite shoe, and you can only pick one, and not a shoe to run in for the rest of your life, but just your favourite shoe overall, finest shoe. Right, oh, I love I love the uh, Asics Nova Blast because it's light mm. and it's cushioned, and it is that the pretty three? Much, yeah, the three, the three, the three is yeah. awesome. Yeah, and yeah. and I. I, I pretty much use it for every run now. <laughs> I mm. find it hard to get out of it. I try other things, but I keep going back to that and just going, I love the feel of it. No matter yeah. what, if I'm running fast or I'm running slow, I still love the feel right. of that over everything. And then Follow last up. question, um, what's your favourite session or workout? Big question, big question. Um, nowadays, whichever, workout. whichever whichever one I get to watch, <laughs> I don't have to do. No, I don't have a favorite session. I'll be honest. So, so you, you can, you, there's nothing you can steal there. Um, what, about but, your, uh, what about your favorite session to prescribe your runners? I change them all the time. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm not being vague to be painful. <laughs> um, I, I change them quite regularly. Uh, I'll say, I'll say 1k reps because it's easy for me to monitor. Nice. That, that looks cool too. That's good. I, like I want to two K reps. Yeah, I do like two K reps. I'm coaching <laughs> someone at the moment, and I, that that thing I put up. I don't know if he listens to this this podcast, but that picture I put up of what are what are some opinions? That was a very common approach. Like you, this guy can be getting put at two K reps. So it's, oh, it's a I'm very built to be coach. Yeah. It's a very progressive cool. overload approach. Yes, two k reps every time we go out on the track, which is good. It's good. Yeah. I I wanted to ask you a personal question because Kelly and I have been having this debate very much on our long run. So at the moment, I'm very much focused on keeping in the zone two or under my um, aerobic threshold LT one. And we were arguing, not arguing, we were debating whether when I go up a hill, at a certain part of the hill that I will go over my AET. I don't know it's not so blocked in, but I'll go over up into zone three and sometimes zone four. What I have been doing is just walking and I'm trying to improve my efficiency to stay in zone two and it's getting better. Do you think I should stay in that zone or just let it go up to get more efficient? Because Kelly thinks I should just let it go up and just still keep it easy, but I think I'll stay and walk and keep it under. I reckon technical? you have a complicating things <laughs> so, <laughs> this is someone that runs a 1950 park run am i over complicating it a bit much yeah yeah over complicating it um i i generally say if if, if you're running on um you know a, a variety of terrain uh depending on what you're trying to get out of it i think ultimately it depends on the purpose of the run but mm. in general it's just keep the effort smooth you know mm. try not to um you know try not to over complicate it i think uh, you know, walk, walking, you know, might uh, might still keep you in certain zones from a from a heart perspective, but mm-hmm. now you're now you're missing out on the the plyometric gains that you that you're yeah. getting from running. So, um, and, and trust me, I still walk plenty of my runs because I'm a bit soft these days, and uh, <laughs> and just go, yeah. you know what, bugger it, just feel like having a walk. But uh, mm-hmm. I'm old and tired and don't care anymore. Um, but <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. In 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 regards to to that, you know, like I said, it, you know, I've I've seen people do hilly tempo runs, and it's all about just try to keep a a consistent effort. You know, um, if you're trying to do something and maintain a certain certain zone, then then the query is, do you need to be including hills into that? So it, it comes down to what what the purpose of the the run is. Um, you know, no doubt your heart rate will go up when you run up a hill. Um, but so are the strength required to get up the hill. So, so it's yeah. not a problem. It's a response to the to the environment. And I'd say don't overcomplicate it. Just keep running. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been good for us to talk about. It takes the oh, takes the idea away from the long run, so we don't talk about anything else for fifty minutes, <laughs> which is nice. <laughs> oh, good. Well, very good. Oh, do you wait? Do you have time for one more question, or do you? Got to yeah, run? yeah, no, I'm all yeah. good. 
But I wanted to to ask when, which I know is going to be tricky. When, like, when does somebody know when to move up in distance? And I see I've heard kind of younger athletes focusing on the ten, sorry, the five and the ten, and then moving up to the half and the marathon, which makes logical sense to me. But is there any specifics with that, or or any recommendations for people that? They, they could follow or what do people do or what's the general consensus on that? Yeah, I, th- I think it's what, what your end game is. What are you, what are you trying mm. to achieve in a long-term uh, perspective? You know, so um, if you, you know, and, and ultimately I'll, I'll answer it with a, with a very simple answer as well, which is depends on if the athlete wants to do it or not. Mm. You know, there's no point putting someone in something they don't really want to do. Probably the cost associated with their, lack of motivation to to deliver something in that space is probably going to counteract any potential benefits they could have from a physiological point of view. So, uh, and, and what I mean by um, what the end game is, is basically like if you've got a young runner who, who, who you can see probably has the attributes that lend themselves to being more of an endurance special, a specialist athlete, someone who might go, you know, 5K, 10K up to the marathon, but you also recognize the requirements of what it takes to be competitive in that space. If that's their Mm. intention, then you might need to hold them back and work on different attributes. So they can actually be a competitor at that event. So, um, so there's no point moving someone up to a 5k who wants to go and uh, who wants to go and win an Olympic games. If, uh, if they can't close fast enough. So it may be mm. in the early stage of their career, they get held back and, and you know, continue to run 800s, 1500s and the likes to develop their speed so they've got enough closing speed to win a race. Mm. If they just want to exist in the race, it's a different story. Mm. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I've seen different stuff. Uh, well, I've seen different successful models of people moving up to marathon. And I think uh, typically in the past, uh, we probably saw people moving up too late. And so mm. I, I see people now sort of moving up, you know, 23, 24 quite safely and even yeah. some people moving up earlier. And that's probably a very much a Western consideration. You know, we, we see some of the East Africans, you know, running marathons much younger than that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's more at the point of when people can absorb the um, training required to do it at the level they want to, that they should move up. But as anything, you know, you go out and distance, you you often progress volume alongside that. So yeah. there's no point moving up if they're if it's going to be a, a a one-way ticket to injury because they haven't yet progressed their training to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, I I don't know if I've got anything too specific from an age point of view. It's probably as specific as I want to be, but yeah. um, but I think that's probably answers the question. Yeah. Do you think? Um, sorry. Um, this this might have a little bit of overlap on that answer as well, but what what do you think are some key aspects that need to be involved in in training as someone sort of progresses through their their running for for the recreational runner? Um, again, I, I feel like it's it's not a point of over complicating it. It's about looking at okay, what are you what are you trying to achieve? Um, so. If your if your idea is to to progress to the point where you want to finish a marathon, well, you obviously got to be confident enough to be able to challenge that. You know, you've, you've got to be able to do some of the volume work to to you know um, complete that task. If you then have a time in mind, well, you've got to become efficient at running at that time. Um, if you you know the same same flows down to the to the lower um, or, or to the the shorter distances. You know, what, what's your intention? Do you want to finish it? Is that a challenge for you? Because some people getting off the couch and running a 5K is a massive thing, you know? Mm-hmm. And then some people say, you know, as, as I have recently, I want to break 20 minutes. So I've got to start doing something to to give me the ability to be able to chase that. So I'm, I'm very much a recreational runner now and, and don't, don't want to be running reps and all the rest of it if people want to <laughs> do that, you know? So, um but I, I, again, I, I just feel like don't overcomplicate it. Like it's a very mm. simple sport. Um, you can, but if your if your intention is to refine your approach because you have a more specific goal in mind, then you might have to do some learning on that as to how how you do that. And that's what that's what it sounds like you guys are sort of trying to do, looking at what zones are going to be, better um, provide the gains that you're looking for specific mm. to the outcome you're looking to achieve. Um, I've sort of come across people who have a wide range of interests in why they run, 
you know and so so i've met people who go i really don't care how long it takes me to run a marathon i just want to finish it you yeah. know that'll be huge and so so you know you, you start to make an assessment for how long it's going to be and someone wants to run six hours well there's no point just making them run for 30 minutes at a time you know the, the, <laughs> the idea you know the reality is they're not going to feel that confident running for six hours and so you know there's about how do you bridge the gap between where you are to where you want to be and what's your timeline to get to that mm -hmm. um and i think that's both from a more specific medium to short term goal but also from a long-term perspective that probably mm -hmm. answers both the question the last two questions yeah. Yeah, do you see like being involved with running so much in the sport? Do you think it's growing in Australia? I, I don't know if I'm Kelly and I are just biased because we're involved trying not involved, but we're just reading a lot about it and listening to people talk about it. Do you think it's growing overall? Like even you know, our Australian runners are becoming more well known just in the general pop, or that you've seen that? I think absolutely. I think we've yeah. seen a, a great um shift in momentum it's for the positive in mm. in both recreational running and running as a as a as a positive form of exercise um and and a lifestyle uh, as we've seen it uh, from a even a performance perspective so um in the last few years i, I was uh, the national distance lead and started tracking the the increase in performance that we're starting to see at an elite level and the momentum was shifting uh, quite considerably and the mm. depth that we've got at certain levels. Now, uh, why why do people now know some more of our um, of our uh, more elite performers? Uh, well, probably because they're performing better. That's a that's <laughs> the first thing. Um, uh, but also probably the access that people have to them. You know, uh, through through sponsorship exposure, through social media, through things things like podcasts, they're now yeah. being given the opportunity to tell their story and connect with the with the wider community. And I think also a lot of brands see the the massive potential by connecting the elite performers with the with the rec running community. And and we can't underestimate the massive impact something like Park Runners had, um, where where people now as families are going out every Saturday morning and and trying yeah. to get a park run done and that was unheard of you know probably 10 years ago and so so that's definitely shifted um where things are going to go is is quite interesting you know we've now got a platform where where it's not weird to run so um <laughs> so you know I, even i know i go out for runs these days and bump into many people running and they'll actually look like they're moving pretty well so mm. um so you know it's it's not like someone's just gone out for the odd run or someone's doing some preseason for the football or soccer um it, it's it's a lifestyle now and i think um mm. in this very time poor world and where the expense of everything is consistently increasing going out for a run costs you nothing uh, all you need is a pair of shoes a, you know shorts and a t-shirt it's it's very cheap it's very affordable and it's not overly challenging to do once you get going um mm. and you can fit it in you can you can go for a half an hour run and if you try to do the same on a bike or cross training you probably need to do double the amount of what you're doing as a runner so if you're mm. time poor, to slip out for half an hour um, mm. is is huge. You know, it's like getting out for an hour um, hour on the bike. You know, and mm. I, I personally know that's why it's come <laughs> back into my lifestyle because I don't I don't have the time to do those things anymore with a with a family and whatever have you. So I, I feel like we are starting to see a massive increase in that, um, and that health promotion is certainly assisting. Um, and you know, I. I just don't see too many barriers for people other than probably what you guys have to deal with, which is injuries, uh, yeah. which are, which are not always fun. Um, but, uh, but certainly are things that it's not impossible to work through those things. Mm -hmm. So um, if people have the patience and, and the passion and the, the interest in doing it, there's <clears throat> definitely a way of finding the, the right mode and, and the right uh, balance to be able to bring it into your life. That's awesome. I just imagine like what you just said, bloody good answer, like, playing behind a promo video or someone running like why to get people involved that's good yeah i mean I, I i certainly have used it as much for the the psychological as i have for the physical mm. um as as you know as, you know you progress through life and you you have greater levels of stress and you need some outlet to that and and it's mm. certainly been you know i, I yeah, sounds sounds like a cliched ad but that's exactly <laughs> what it what it does for me these days and and i absolutely love it for that reason and that's yeah. that's completely separate to the competitive side of running that I used to be involved in. Mm. Now, Kelly and I wanted to ask, 
are we able to jump in on a track session if we come down to Adelaide? Do you think I could lead from the front for the Team Tempo? I've got my heart rate strapped. <laughs> a couple of super shoes. I don't know if I'd be keeping up, but we'll see. You're more than welcome to. Always welcome. Yeah, that's good. They get a bit of draft behind me. I'm six foot six, 100 kilos, so they could form the little thing behind me, make it a bit easier. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get our juniors to sit on the back here. <laughs> Surely I can run with the elites. No, I'm running with anyone. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, nah. lovely. Wait, thank welcome. you yeah, so much for, for coming on for part two. Again, we very much appreciate it. I, I knew that we, we always have a lot of questions, but mate, it was great. I think your answers are so thorough and, and well thought out. So I'm so happy we got to do a part two. So thank you mate, so much for coming back on. No worries, guys. Anytime. Thank awesome. You. Awesome. See you later, mate. All right. Go get to your clients. See you guys. <laughs> <laughs>